One of the classic evidentiary objections, along with non-responsiveness, is to say, objection, that question assumes a fact, not in evidence. The tool here is for you to be attuned to questions that proceed from a false premise, or even a premise that lacks an adequate evidentiary foundation. The objection is appropriate whenever a litigant asks a loaded question. Probably the most famous example used to teach this concept is the hypothetical cross-examination question, when did you stop beating your spouse? The assumes a fact objection is appropriate if there isn't an adequate evidentiary foundation that the witness A has a spouse, B at some point in the past had been beating his or her spouse, and C had at some point more recently stopped beating her. If you are asked a question that assumes a fact that is not only not in evidence but is in fact false, you should object and possibly respond with your own question. Who said I was married? Who said I ever beat my spouse? Who said I ever stopped? In the last lecture, I emphasized how many people fail to respond to the question asked, but the loaded question plays on the desire in some people to be responsive. If a CEO is asked, how can you justify your firm's price gouging of its customers? The questioner wins with either kind of normal responsiveness. Either the answer, the price gouging can't be justified, or the answer, the price gouging can be justified, implicitly acknowledges the premise that there's price gouging going on. This assumes a fact not in evidence objection gives you a new way to be responsive by challenging the question's presuppositions. You will be a star if you can catch one of your professors asking a loaded question and respond, objection, assumes a fact not in evidence. My kids, again, use this tool against me to their great amusement. For example, imagine my daughter tells me she had lunch at a fancy restaurant. I then ask her, were you the youngest uh, patron in the restaurant? What facts have I assumed in uh, that are not in evidence when I ask this question. Can you see that there, the, it, that there were other patrons in the restaurant? Indeed, to be pedantic, there would need to be two or more other patrons for the superlative adjective youngest to be proper. If there was only one other patron, the appropriate question would be, were you the younger patron? I was once an expert witness in a glass ceiling uh, case for a plaintiff claiming that she was discriminated against uh, in promotion uh, by her phenomenally successful employer. During my deposition, the lawyer for the defendant asked me to answer a counterfactual question of the form, if the plaintiff was a man and the following facts were true, would your answer be the same? I responded the question inappropriately assumed a fact not in evidence. Can you see the lawyer's mistake? You see, by asking if the plaintiff was a man, the lawyer was implying that there was some non-remote possibility that the plaintiff was a man. The lawyer should have asked, quote, if the plaintiff were a man, unquote. Beyonce got this right when she sings, if I were a boy. During my deposition, after going back and forth a few rounds with the opposing lawyer, I finally asked him if he intended to use a different mood. Being a stickler about the subjunctive mood and superlative adjectives is, well, obnoxious. But paying attention to whether questions have an adequate and accurate evidentiary foundation is a skill well worth having.